Okay. Hello, everyone. And welcome to our event this evening featuring Visa Butler and Dr. Carolyn Maslumi in conversation. I'm Lauren Applebaum, the Associate Curator of American Art at the Toledo Museum of Art. And I'm pleased to be joined by so many of you this evening. We've uh, had hundreds of people register and we're beyond delighted that you are as excited to hear from these two speakers as we are. This event is being held in conjunction with our current exhibition, Radical Tradition, American Quilts and Social Change, which places historical and contemporary works together in dialogue to explore how quilts have been used to voice opinions, raise awareness and enact social and political reform for the past two centuries. This exhibition is up now through February 14th and can be viewed during our updated hours, which are Sunday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Friday and Saturday from 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. While circumstances in our world are making it difficult for many of you who are tuning in from far away to visit TMA in person, we are grateful for the opportunity to connect with you all virtually. Before we get started, I'd like to say that we at the Toledo Museum of Art uh, recognize and honor the past, present, and future lives of, ind of indigenous people in the Toledo area and thank them for being stewards of the lands and waters on which the museum's campus now resides. The museum was built on the ancestral homelands of the Kickapoo and the Erie and later the Wyandotte, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. We acknowledge that several other indigenous peoples also call, called this region their home, including the Miami, Fox, and Peoria. Through shared knowledge and exchange, we aim to further understand the history of the land our institution now occupies, and we commit to sharing this story and working to dismantle the systemic invisibility of indigenous peoples. We also wanna take a moment to recognize those who've been fighting for racial justice in our institutions and communities. One of the goals of our program this evening is to discuss and learn how artists are engaging the nationwide reckoning with systemic racism and injustice in our current moment, while also exploring its long historical roots. As you will all see, quilt making is a particularly potent medium for exposing and exploring these issues, and also for preserving and perpetuating these histories. Uh, and we're honored to have Visa Butler and Dr. Carolyn Maslumi in conversation with one another about these topics. We're going to begin this evening with uh, brief introductions before turning it over to our speakers who will each give a presentation on their work. These individual presentations will be followed by a conversation between them. And then we'll open it up for an audience Q&A. Uh, since this webinar, uh, since this is a webinar, we won't be able to see or hear anyone who's in attendance, but we do want to invite you all to enter any questions that you might have for either of our speakers in the Q&A box at the lower center of your screen. Um, you can enter questions as they come to mind throughout the presentations or later during the conversation, and I will pose them to the speakers at the end of the program as time permits. And questions that are entered will only be viewable by the event hosts, not the entire audience. Um, I also should say that this event is being recorded and will be posted online for later viewing. Okay, so it is now my great pleasure to introduce our speakers. Visa Butler is a contemporary fiber artist known for her vibrant, brightly colored quilted portraits celebrating Black identity, history, and culture. Born and raised in New Jersey as the daughter of educators, Butler continues to live and practice in New Jersey um, today. She graduated cum laude with a BFA from Howard University before earning a master's of arts in teaching from Montclair State University and she is now represented by the Claire Oliver Gallery in Harlem. Her quilts have been exhibited both nationally and internationally and are represented in a number of museum collections, including the Art Institute of Chicago, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Newark Museum, the Orlando Museum, the Minneapolis Institute of Art, and many others. Um, Butler has been the subject of two solo exhibitions this year at the Katona Museum of Art and the Art Institute of Chicago. 
Her incredible life-size quilted portrait of Frederick Douglass entitled The Storm, The Whirlwind, and The Earthquake, which Bisa will spend some time discussing tonight, uh, was recently acquired by the Toledo Museum of Art and is featured in our current exhibition, Radical Tradition, American Quilts and Social Change. Dr. Carolyn Maslumi is an acclaimed historian, curator, author, lecturer, artist, and mentor and is, an, is a leading authority on African-American quilts and quilt making. Meslumi earned a doctorate in aerospace engineering before turning her attention to fiber arts. In 1985, she founded the Women of Color Quilters Network, which is a national organization that provides its 1,700 members with important resources and opportunities to show their work, both nationally and abroad. The organization also uh, focus, is focused on educating others about the unrecognized contributions of African-American quilt artists and has been recognized by the International Labor Dep Department in Geneva and the United Nations for its developmental programs to help advance women. Her most recent curatorial project entitled We Are the Story is a multi-site exhibition based in Minneapolis, which responds to the brutal killing of George Floyd by a Minneapolis police officer this past May. In addition to curating exhibitions and writing books, Maslumi is herself a maker of quilts and has exhibited her own work widely. Her narrative quilts explore such themes as women's rights, musical legacy, African-American history, and racial justice. Dr. Maslumi has been the recipient of many honors, among them the 2003 Ohio Heritage Fellowship Award. In 2014, she was named a National Heritage Fellow by the National Endowment for the Arts, which is the highest award given in the United States for the traditional arts. She was awarded the Distinguished Scholar and Celebrated Artist Lifetime Achievement Award by Faith Ringgold's Anyone Can Fly Foundation. And in 2016, she was inducted into the Quilters Hall of Fame Museum. So two remarkable speakers, as you all can see. So at this point, I will turn it over to Bisa Butler to share more with you about her work. Thank you again for joining in. Thank you so much for that introduction, Lauren. And thank you to your staff at the Toledo Museum of Art. Thank you, Dr. Matlumi. I am so happy to be here with you today. And also thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, it's really my pleasure to be able to connect with people. I mean, this is our, this is our modus operandi now is, is through Zoom. And for those of you who don't know, um, I am an artist who uses quilting as a medium. Um, I'm primarily a portrait artist, but I have done other things. And I'd like to start off just by sharing where I started briefly and, and what I am doing now. So I'm going to share a few images with you all today. And I'm gonna start with how a lot of artists do. A lot of people ask me, what is it that makes me be an artist? What made me? start this? What was my interest? <clears throat> and the image that you're seeing right now is something that I'm working on currently. Um, this is right on my table. It's brand new. And I think that it, it really is sometimes it helps to sort of start where I am and then I'll go back. So if you zoom in, and I'll zoom in for you so you can see that this piece is not sewn yet. And what I'm doing is layering on little bits of fabric. And if, if for those of you who don't recognize him, but this is my portrait of Chadwick Boseman, who has recently passed away. Um, I think his birthday was just his, well, we call it his heavenly birthday, but his birthday would have been this past week where he would have only been 44 years old. And I have a lot in common with Chadwick. Um, we both went to Howard University. I think he was a freshman when I was a senior and I didn't have interaction with him at that time, but we were both in the School of Fine Arts. Um, and I felt moved and, and I felt so driven to create this portrait of him based on what he represented to us as a people. 
And when I say that, I mean that he was the first like major actor. Um, he was in the first major movie that that received critical acclaim, uh, the Black Panther. He was a black superhero. He played King T'Challa. And not only that, but he had this standard of how he represented himself, how he represented black people. And that's what compelled me to create this portrait. And it's often what compels me to create most of the artwork that I create. Um, I am now going to share a few images of, of where I started in the beginning because right there we started at the end. So let, let's, uh, these are my grandparents, um, Violet Hammond and Dr. Francis Hammond. And I put this up here because I wanna show what kind of photographs I grew up looking at and also explain a little bit about what kind of people that they were. My grandfather was a student and a scholar and both of these two, they were young people at the time, it feels strange saying that, met at Xavier University in Louisiana. My grandmother was a student and my grandfather was a young professor. And um, they ended up getting married and my grandfather was decided to pursue his PhD in Belgium right before World War II. And so I put this photo here because I wanted you all to see that uh, I have big shoes to fill. A lot of times people say to me, you know, Bisa, we feel like um, you've, you've done very well, but I'm always looking at the people around me. I'm looking at my community, I'm looking at my family. So I grew up with the idea of my grandparents in Belgium at the beginning of the war. And this photo was taken from a magazine, a newspaper article where they had just arrived back from Belgium the women and children were evacuated and then my grandfather followed after because Belgium was getting ready to be invaded by the Nazis. And then this photo here, I chose it because this is my grandfather in Belgium as a young student. And I grew up coming across photos like this, sitting by my grandmother's lap and asking her, who is that? What's going on? I knew my grandfather as an elderly man. so. I didn't know who this young guy was with this cap and I'll zoom in more so you can see, but he has all these leather gloves. And I mean, he was a really stylish guy. And this spurred on a lot of questions for me. First of all, what was he doing in Belgium? And what is that building behind him? And this is not the impression that you would get of African-Americans if you are reading any history books. Or, or watching TV. So these were the people who were guiding me and who inspire me to this day. Um, I wanna also talk about that because what inspires any artist, what is driving them? I, I have this family tradition and this history. And so that's always pushing me and telling me like, in my mind, I feel like I'm not doing enough. I need to do more. And so I would like to share a really important piece to me that the Toledo Museum of Art has acquired. <clears throat> and there. So we all know who this is, uh, Mr. Frederick Douglass. And I showed that photo of my grandfather in order to show you that at one point I was making artwork that was based off of my family photos. And then when I started working more professionally and working with a wider audience, I had to really search deep and think to myself, what is it that I wanna to say to the world? And I started thinking about those people who I admire, those people who, who I feel are guiding the light in my life. And one of those people would be Frederick Douglass himself. Um, when I came across this photo of Frederick Douglass, I mean, you, what you see here is him as a very young man. He was barely even 30, if he was 30. And, and some of the um, guests who maybe historians can, can actually research that. But this photo let me realize that there was a lot more to Frederick Douglass that I wasn't aware of. Look at his tie and look at that cravat. <clears throat> look at how his hair is parted and, and coiffed just so. 
this is not a man who takes his appearance lightly. And I know from my own research how important it was for him to present himself as an intelligent human being, a person who can look you directly in your eye, which was not the standard at that time. This is this is during the slave era in the 19, 18, excuse me, 1850s. Um, when he took this photo, he would have been a fugitive of the law. And there was a particular quote where Frederick Douglass said to a crowd, I appear before you this evening as a thief and a robber. I stole this head, these eyes, these limbs from my body, this body from my master and ran off with them. So I started thinking about Frederick Douglass and that statement, him being a man who has to steal his own being from another human being. And this is the version that I created that is now in the collection of the Toledo Museum of Art. And I'm zooming in so that you can see how I interpreted the photo versus the quilt. I'm using bits of silk and lace and velvet. And I wanted you all to get that firmness and that serious of Frederick Douglass, but also that youthful, youthful beauty that he had. I used a lot of reds and intense colors because I want to talk about the boldness of the man and the strength of the man itself, himself. When I zoom out, if you look at his jacket, you'll see those birds on it. That's a particular type of fabric called speed bird. And I use fabric not only as a decorative element, but to explain a history. And I want to say about myself, um, my father's from Ghana, my mother's African American. And so this West African fabric, this is a fabric that's made in Holland. It's called Dutch wax fabric, but the speed bird represents transition. It represents change. And so in Africa, that is how people see it. And here in the US, we look at birds. A lot of times we associate that with freedom. So I'm using the fabric in two ways to talk about the African meaning of it, um, our own African-American or American sensibilities and what we make of it. And now using that to describe Frederick Douglass as a person who had to free himself from slavery. On his sleeves, you'll see an alphabet pattern and you see the A and the C and the G and the M. That particular fabric is called ABCD and it represents in Africa, people who wear that fabric are saying that I'm proud that I am literate, I can read and I can write. And this is another close up of the Frederick Douglass quilt. And right here, I just wanted to show two versions of sort of like how my thought processes are when I'm working. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see the first set of shoes that I made for him. A lot of times I'll be almost done. You can even see that I had began my stitching and the quilt pattern in the background is in reference or a reminder of my father's heritage and my heritage, the Ghanaian um, patterns. There's a fabric that is woven. Um, well, it was exclusively in Ghana, I'm pretty sure. I think I have heard that the Chinese are doing their own version of kente cloth these days, but originally it was originally from Ghana and it's woven in strips and they're using these geometric patterns. So when I quilt my artwork, I'm also trying to emulate the patterns of the kente cloth. And then the bottom shoes are the first version. I was almost done. The quilt was like ready to be shipped off. And I just looked at it and I decided that they were not right. They just didn't look right to me. So I had to use that little stitch ripper, get them off and remake the shoes all over again. And then this is a full version finished of Frederick Douglass. And I wanna say that the photos that inspired this, they were all with him seated. I could not find a photo of Frederick Douglass standing full out. So I had to use a cropped version. And this one here, this is actually, it's an engraving. The, the original photo of this was lost, maybe even in Frederick Douglass' lifetime. And they had artists who would go over and make engravings of photos for for newspapers. And thank God that they did that, that I could use this image in order to get the idea of his physicality, the length of his arms, the size of his hands and his torso. And I used that to inform myself how exactly I felt that his, his, um, his height and his weight were. And then this is a photo of my grandparents. It's a quilt that I made. 
um, based on their wedding photo. This is a photo of my father's family in Ghana. And all the way to the left, this young boy, you can barely make him out, but this is the only surviving photo that my father has of his family. And so it's really important to him and it's important to me to see him as a little boy. And I will say, just as a side note, you zoom in, you'll see he's holding a little ball in his hand. Um, my father loved soccer as a lot of children do. And he ended up going to Seton Hall University and he was the captain of his soccer team. And uh, my father grew up in uh, rural Ghana, Northern Ghana, and he ended up, and he was a college president for 30, seven years and then I think he came on three years as an interim so it went to over 40 years of Essex County College right in North New Jersey and this is one of the first quilts that I had ever made I did this while I was in grad school and I did an imagined photo of my grandfather my father's father by cutting up pieces of African fabric and they were actually my father's dashikis so I didn't have a lot of money. I was in grad school and I'm cutting up these dashikis in order to make this collage image of the grandfather that I never knew. And then this is the quilted version of my father's family that I presented to him when he finally did retire from Essex County College. And oh, I added this in here because I think it's gorgeous and I, um, I'm really proud and honored to be a part of the radical tradition in American quilt and social change. And I will, let's see, I have a few more minutes. So I'm gonna share just a, a few more things and then I am going to pass this on to Dr. Maslumi. So I'd like to show you sort of my roots and then a few more, and then I will talk a little bit more about the piece of um, Chadwick Boseman that I did. <clears throat> okay, so this, I just showed this in another talk, but I rarely ever do. This is the very, very first, I did this while I was a student at Howard University. Um, my professor, Al Smith, asked me to dig deeper, look into myself. I was a painting student and my paintings were not quite getting it, but I always loved beautiful fabrics and rich colors. And Al Smith told me, use fabric like Ramir Bearden and collage like he did. So this is just glued. And if we zoom in, you can see like my, even my pencil marks, or I guess it's a blue pen mark. I don't know why I use the blue pen, but being a college kid, that is what I did. This is, um, I just took a picture of it. It's been wrapped up for years and it looks, basically exactly as I did it. And this was a painting from class. And I'm going to say that my paintings, I think, were fair, but they were not special. And, and, and that being that they looked very much like everyone else's paintings in class, at least they did to me. Uh, maybe some people will find, feel differently about it. But I feel like fabric gave me the voice to be able to express the history and the heritage that I'm interested in, not just the color. And a little about the colors here, Howard University, my professors were a part of a group called AfroCobra, the African Coalition of Bad and Relevant Artists in the 60s. So by the time they were my professors in the 90s, they were still part of that coalition, but they had their own manifesto and that was to show black people in a positive light, show make sure that black people see themselves reflected in their artwork, use colors that you would see in, on the continent in African cloth, but they were describing their colors in a new way by calling them the Kool-Aid colors. So when you see this bright orange and the green and the yellow, I'm still using those Kool-Aid colors in my artwork, but now instead of layers of paint, I'm using layers of fabric. And this is by, done by a Howard professor, Wadsworth Jarrell, who, who was a part of the Afrocobra group. And I put this here just so you can see that, you can see echoes of my work there. Look at the oranges and the, and the greens and the reds. It's not that I'm directly looking at my professor's work and then going to make my quilt, but that is the way I was trained. So my color sensibilities are still very much in line with the Afrocobra group using these Kool-Aid colors. And, and also the imagery, black people as, as 
proud, B black people is beautiful. Um, they used a lot of typeface words or actual actual words in the paintings to make it clear what you were saying. I am black and I'm proud. Um, and I'm not going anywhere. And, and by representing black heroes, we look at that now as commonplace. But in the 60s, um, this would have been a really far out and a revolutionary thing to do to portraitize a man such as Malcolm X, who at the time was very controversial and probably still is to the state. I don't always portray people who are famous. I like the idea that we are all valuable and worthwhile in our own right. And so I'm looking for those things as I study a photograph and what is it that I find beautiful about this person. And this piece I call Africa, the land of hope for Negro peoples of the world. And if I zoom in, you can see that that was the title of um, a Harlem newspaper, the Negro World Paper, and that, that it was a paper that was written by Marcus Garvey and, and, his, and his compatriots. And the title of the article was Africa, the Land of Hope for Negro Peoples of the World. And this man, Emmett Scott, who is portrayed here, was actually working with Booker T. Washington. I know Booker T. Washington and Marcus Garvey, they were more on opposing views but actually in line with the fact that they were looking to elevate the life and, and the outcome of black people in this country and in the diaspora. And then I, I had a closer up version just so you could see a little bit of the things that drew me in this image. And of course, shoes. I'm very much interested in shoes. Black people love shoes. We like to look good. And I always try to make sure that I honor the people who I am portraying. And I wanted you to just see briefly um, an image from my show that is up at the Art Institute of Chicago, but is closed, unfortunately, because of COVID. But I also put this here so you can see the scale of what I'm doing, um, a piece that I did called The Warmth of Other Sons. And then there's a portrait of my grandparents there with a, one of my aunts that is in the exhibit. And then I will close this out with just talking a little bit about this portrait of Chadwick Boseman. Um, I called it forever. And I was thinking of Wakanda forever. I was also thinking of a few years ago when Chadwick spoke at Howard University's um, commencement exercises and he ended it with Howard forever. Um, I was also thinking about forever as in how I feel. I'm, I'm a very, um, spiritual person and I believe that our souls do continue on forever and you will see that I'm still using fabric to describe Chadwick's um, his his where I would like him to be I should say when I think about people who passed away I think about them passing into the forever and going into heaven or into a beautiful spiritual place so that background behind him is sort of like this idea of paradise, but then it's also the idea of maybe making people think about Wakanda. And the fabric here is from this country, this company called Lisco that makes these really intricate um, Dutch wax patterns using a lot of African designers. And so I thought what better fabric to sort of support this idea of Wakanda forever and, and Chadwick hopefully he will remain in the forever. And I just wanna end my talk with that. And I wanna pass this on to another person who I admire deeply, who is Dr. Mazumi. She's been a friend and a mentor of mine for years. And I'm so excited to be able to hear her talk and to also be able to talk to her afterwards. Thank you, Bisa. And I'm very happy to be here and happy to see so many people join in this Zoom uh, meeting to hear what we have to say about some of my favorite things on earth, and that's quilts. Um, when I think about defining myself, I always say that I'm an African-American woman born in the Jim Crow segregated South. I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, I'm a wife. I love story quilts. 
I like to make quilts that document our history as African Americans living here in this country. I also like to address uh, social and political issues of uh, immigrants and uh, women. I've, I'm starting out here with a few of my quilts. Um, this particular quilt is called Bloody Sunday. And I'm from Louisiana and I vividly remember watching the television news and there was a report, this was during the civil rights era of 600 peaceful unarmed demonstrators that were in Selma and they were violently attacked. Civil, uh, civil rights workers had sought and received court protection for a full scale march from Selma to the state capital of Montgomery. But instead of being protected, state troopers and local police used tear, uh, tear gas, whips, clubs, and dogs to attack the marches and drive them back. And that demonstration was led by Dr. King and John Lewis. And they were trying to cross that Pettus Bridge to make that journey to Montgomery. And that march was really a turning point of the civil rights movement because all of America watching television, black and white saw what was happening in Selma and what was actually happening to the civil rights workers. Um, I vividly remember one person that was on the ground getting hit with the police clubs and bitten by the dogs and that man's body and his face always stood out in my mind. I was a young person at the time and I did not know who that man was. I later found out as an adult that it was John Lewis. Anyway, these uh, marchers did get federal protection. They uh, started their march after several days and the crowds of participants swelled from 600 to, um, I believe, 25, over 25,000 people, African American, whites, all people that were interested in civil rights and voting rights for African Americans. When I made this quilt, in my mind, back in the day, I always thought, if I ever meet John Lewis, I'm going to give him this quilt. I never thought I would have the opportunity in my lifetime to meet John Lewis. Um, three years ago, I four years ago, I was awarded the National Endowment for the Arts National Heritage Award. And you have to go to Washington to receive that honor. And there was a big ceremony and whatnot for it. I called John Lewis's office and I asked his secretary if it were possible that I see him when I come to Washington. And he told me he would let me know after checking uh, Mr. Lewis's schedule. A few weeks later, I got an email saying that he would receive me um, when I came to Washington to accept the National Heritage Award. Anyway, I got a chance to meet him and I presented him with the quilt and it was quite a moment um, to meet one of my heroes and to give him this quilt that I made that was inspired by him. And it was really, it was quite the moment. 
uh, with him telling me and my family about some of the events that he had experienced during the civil rights era. So I, I just often think what a brave soul he was. And so many of the civil rights workers, how many people would give their lives for a cause they put their lives on the line with every march. So with my quilts, I like to document our history. That's very important to me. Uh, my colleague Roland Freeman said decades ago that uh, quilts are like historical, historic documents and they are they very much are indeed. And you have people around the world that are studying quilts and decades from now, we will have people studying these quilts and they get a glimpse into what was happening here in this country with our lives, with our families, with our communities. So to me, that's one of the purposes of making these quilts. May I have the next image? Most of my quilts are uh, done in black and white. I like the simplicity of it. And I, I am not a colorist. I have a very difficult time working with color. It takes me forever to audition the fabrics and to choose the color. And when I think about it, I think, gee, I could have made three quilts while I'm auditioning this fabric and trying to figure out the color palette for, uh, for the work. So I started over 10 years ago to make quilts that are just in black and white. And I like the starkness of it. And there's nothing that gets in between uh, what I'm trying to uh, envision in the quilts and what I want to say, it's just right there in your face. This particular piece is called Precious, and it honors the sacred station of mothers. And I like to make work about the status of women because they have the most important job on the planet. They have the most influential job on the planet. Every human being comes through women. And mothers are the first teachers. So women influence all of humanity. And sometimes I think young, young women forget just how powerful, how very powerful women are. Uh, we typically don't start wars. <laughs> we don't deal with uh, uh, wars with violence and bombs and bullets, but I often say we have something much, much more powerful. We have the sword of our tongue because what women have to say is powerful, very powerful. And the people that we raise, our children, they listen. They listen and our words are powerful. I have two sons and I often say, I can bring them to their knees with words. Words from women are powerful. So this quilt celebrates uh, women and the nurturing of their children. And on the back of this quilt is a quote. And the quote says, O ye loving mothers, know ye that in God's sight, the best of all ways are worshiping him. And the best you can do is educate the children and train them in all the perfections of mankind. No nobler deed than this can be imagined. And this is a quote from Abdul Baha, who's the eldest son of Baha'u'llah, who's the founder of the Baha'i faith, of which my husband is a member of the Baha'i faith. May I have the next image? 
Well, this deals with immigration in this country. Um, xenophobia and racism are alive and well in America, when, especially when you examine immigration reform in this country. That uh, discussion has polarized cities, states, it's uh, confounded politicians and pit citizens upon citizen. And there's an uncomfortable truth to this conundrum. The policy discussion surrounding who deserves to be let into our country is very exclusive. Um, you don't see easily people of color having an easy time to immigrate to this country and to become citizens. The title across this quilt says certain restrictions do apply. And I say that they, they apply, but they, they apply unequally. There's a quote at the foot of the Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. That does not go for everybody. And at the bottom of this phrase, you see people in boats that are overturned and people in the water uh, that are drowning. And this reminds me, uh, when, I, when I did it, I was reminded of the Haitian people who to this day die trying to come from Haiti to the shore, uh, Florida shores. And they are not granted amnesty here. Then it's, it's very difficult for them to stay here. So I made this quilt to show that things are not equal when it comes to uh, who receives citizenship in this country, as was noted by our uh, president who declared who he wanted, who he preferred to be in the country. Uh, and it certainly wasn't people of color, let alone black folk. Next. This is called in the spirit of forgiveness. And as I said, I, I like to make quilts about stories. Um, this quilt is about the life of a man, Adrian Vlock, who at one point was the minister of law and order in South Africa. In fact, from uh, 1986 to 1991, uh, during the final years of apartheid, the, the apartheid era, he was the minister of law and order in South Africa. And it was under his watch that thousands of Black South African men, women, and children were killed. After apartheid, um, there was this committee that Desmond Tutu, among others, helped find, uh, found, and that was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, where whites would come before this commission and in, admit committing crimes against Blacks in South Africa. Um, Vlock decided that he wanted to come before this commission and he let uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu, who was a member of the commission, know that he wanted to come before this commission and admit his uh, transgressions and abuse against the black people of South Africa. He told Desmond Tutu also that he wanted to wash the feet of some of the women, the wives and mothers 
of men that he had killed. I think that the act of washing another human being's feet, it's one of the most humbling things that you can do in this life. So he did this in order to um, show how sorry he was for what he did. A lot of Africans, a lot of Black South Africans still to this day don't believe that Vlock was sincere. However, after uh, going before the commission, he devoted his life to taking care of uh, the poor, especially children in Soweto. So this, this is his life now. So I wanted to uh, capture this story in a quilt because I think that forgiveness is important. In each one of my quilts, most of the quilts there are uh, rings and you can see them in the background. And to me, it's symbolic of, uh, it's, it, of continuing life. Always I have my quilts bordered by some type of patchwork pattern. And that's my way of paying homage to the quilt makers that have come before me. Uh, this is a whole cloth quilt, and it's about uh, six by six and a half feet. And it, I design and draw on software, and I had this printed. And after it's printed, I embellish it with more painting and stenciling, and then machine quilt the piece. Next. This quilt is called Seeking Comfort, Finding Pain. And it honors the comfort women of World War II. And the comfort women were the victims of the largest case of human trafficking in the 20th century. And they've been left out of many textbooks. The uh, Japanese took almost 30,000 women. Um, they were forced into sexual slavery in what were called comfort houses. And these women suffered tremendously. And many of them, many of them did not survive the ordeal of working in these comfort houses. Um, after the war, the remaining women living asked the United Nations to, they went before the United Nations many, many, many times um, and asked that Japan acknowledge their military's role in this issue and Japan refused for many, many years. And it was only, um, I believe three years ago that the Japanese government issued an apology and offered restitution to the women that, the comfort women that are still living of which there, there are very, very few. So um, this, this quilt is made in honor of the comfort women. Next. Um, this piece is called a peacekeeper's gift and <clears throat> initially it was printed in black and white and I decided to paint over it and uh, it was indeed an experiment but I, I liked I, I like the results the finished results and <clears throat> this quilt conveys the injustices brought upon women who are victims of sexual assault 
by uh, UN peacekeepers. These are men that work for the United Nations and they're sent to countries in Africa and Haiti to protect the population. But sometimes instead of doing that, they take advantage of young girls in these African countries and in Haiti. And um, they have relations with them and many of them become pregnant. In this piece, I show this African girl and in the background there are several African girl, young girls and they're all pregnant. Um, but this woman is holding a, this girl is holding a mixed race baby. And this, this children should be a gift. But in this instance, this gift becomes a problem for the mother because these children are ostracized in their villages and the mothers have a difficult time taking care of uh, their children. And countries in Africa have brought this too. Before the United Nations, many times, still to this day, and uh, there's nothing really that's being done about this because this, this terrible behavior is still going on. Um, again, you see in the background the circles and uh, a lot of my quilts are surrounded by flowers because flowers remind me of, of life. Um, and they're beautiful. And I like to use them in the quilts. I love flowers. I can't grow them, but I can paint them in my quilts. That's the only way I, I'll, I'll have any. Um, next. Part of my job as the founder of the Women of Color Quilters Network, which is a 40 year organization um, I founded the network to preserve quilting in the African American community and uh, document the quilts. Um, this was inspired by the death of George Floyd. When I saw that film of him being murdered, it just, as a mother, it just, I, I still find it very difficult to speak about that. Um, so I, I wanted to do something to call attention to police brutality and to honor those uh, people that were killed by the police. And I spoke with the director of the, um, textile center in Minneapolis and asked if he could help me find spaces for quilts. I wanted to blanket the city with quilts about uh, racism and police brutality. And this quilt I commissioned from uh, an artist, Carolyn Crump. And I wanted this to be the centerpiece of this exhibition. In the background, you'll see George Floyd and this is called uh, cracked justice. On the pavement, you in the cracks, you see uh, different victims of police brutality. And she made an uh, effort to show people that participated in the in the protest, black and white, uh, who came together to uh, help call attention to. Uh, the issue of Black Lives Mattering. Next. These are all quilts that are part of that exhibition, the, the exhibition in, in Minneapolis. Uh, it's a series of exhibits, seven exhibits, two of which are were jewelry and uh, four solo exhibitions by individual artists. 
and one other additional exhibition from the Women of Color Quilters Network that honored the Freedom Riders. When I put out a call for um, people to put work in for the jewelry show, I was shocked. I got inquiries from around the world. And the one commonality that everybody had that contacted me was that they all said they were people of color and um, um, our story is their story. So this piece is called A Glimpse of Racism, all the things, these are things that this artist sees that uh, deal with racism. The next piece, next. Um, this piece is by Glenda uh, Richardson and it's called Black Lives Matter. And in the middle, I love, I, it's surrounded by the names of uh, people who've been killed by the police, but also I like the caption. They tried to bury us. They didn't know we were seeds. You can't get rid of us. It's not, it's not easy, we keep popping up. Uh, because of the strength of Black people. Next. This piece is also by uh, Carolyn Crump, and it shows three prominent civil rights leaders, Abernathy, Dr. King, and John Lewis, and they're held together with the thread, these red stripes from our, uh, symbolizing our country, and they come together they worked together during the civil rights uh, era um, to bring about change. Next, got one more piece here. Um, well, this, this piece is by Michelle Flamer. And on the back of this quilt, there's a letter and it's called Dear White People. And I'm, I wanted to read the uh, um, statements by the artist, which I think is very important, but we don't have we don't have that much time. So, but this piece is called Black Lives Matter and it's by Michelle Flamer. And the next piece, please. This piece is made by um, Deanna Tyson from London, who's white. And she chose to capture the removal of um, statues of people who uh, enslaved others and were racist. And um, she has Frederick Douglass on one side pulling down a statue and Barack Obama. So the, this is just a glimpse of the over 200 quilts that are in the um, exhibition in uh, Minnesota. So that's, that ends my time to speak about the quilts and Visa. Thank you so much. Dr. Mazumi, I was just drawn into the story. And I think that we, we do have some time if, if you wanted to read the statement on the oh, back of okay. the Black Lives Matter. The reason, the reason that I think, and there's a background to this, the reason that uh, statements from artists are important because early on in quilt history, uh, when people were writing about quilt history, they, it wasn't African-American people, they, it was white folks. And they didn't, they never asked the quilters what anything meant, what inspired them to make the quilts. They would just make up in their own mind the story, uh, um, an inspiration for the quilters. And they never gave the quilters an opportunity to speak for themselves, which is wrong. That did not change until scholars, African-American scholars like Cuesta Benberry, Roland Freeman, Gladys Marie Fry, Kyra Hicks, and myself 
started writing about African-American quilts and what they meant. So for me, every exhibition I do, I write a catalog or a book and always include the statement by, um, by the artist. So um, one statement that I would like to read, if we could go back to the piece by uh, Michelle Flamer, the piece, uh, red piece, it says Black Lives Matter. The title of that piece is, uh, it's number 11. Okay, the title of the piece is Dear White People. And on the back of this quilt is Michelle Flamer's statement. And it says, why do some of you have trouble understanding Black Lives Matter? Your sons and daughters seem to get it because they're out in the streets protesting with us. When I say Black Lives Matter, you answer, but all lives matter. Are you uninformed? Don't you know that Black people were brought here as slaves 400 years ago and considered three-fifths of a man and not fully human? You continue to strip us of our humanity for decades of Jim Crow, denying us even the most basic of liberties like attending school and owning a home and voting. Even if you didn't get past the sixth grade, you probably learned these words from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's right, life itself is unalienable right. So please tell me why it is when I decry the slaughter of unarmed black men and women by the police, you respond that statistically more unarmed white people are killed every year. I say that's dishonest since black people were two and a half times more likely to be killed by a cop than whites. So next time when you read or hear Black Lives Matter, please go to your quiet place and give that some additional thought before you confront me with your biased ignorance. Sincerely, Michelle Flamer, a black woman. Anyway, all of these it's my hope that when people go to Minneapolis and they see these shows, they come away with a different thought about how it feels to live as an African-American in this country with all the injustices that we have to endure and think about how it would be if the shoe were on the other foot and just give them, it's about giving people a glimpse into our lives as African-Americans here in the United States. It's not easy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and that spurs me on to ask you, um, you talked about your, your organizing of this particular show and the span of it and how huge it is and allowing the giving the artist that voice and that space to say for themselves. And it makes me so curious to know where did this desire come from in you to help other artists and, and then when? Um, well, at the onset of, at the start of finding founding the Women of Color Quilters Network, it was important for me to uh, give the artists venues for their work because 40 years ago, you did not find African-Americans that were joining white quilt guilds because they were reluctant. Their work looked different. It wasn't accepted. Um, we had no avenues to display the work 
So it's important for me as a quilt historian and as the founder of WCQN <clears throat> to document African-American quilt works within the uh, uh, scope of American quilt studies. We have to have a footprint in that history and that history has to be noted. And it's, it's important to give artists that opportunity to show their work. Many of the, most of the artists that I work with are hobbyists, but you have a small, very small segment of them that want to be professional artists and they have to be allowed an opportunity to show their work. So anything that I can do to help them, mm -hmm. uh, that's my charge, that's my duty. I feel responsible um, yeah. to offer whatever help that I can. Yeah. I mean, I see that, I mean, me being the recipient of such help, <laughs> the audience may not know that Dr. Mazumi is one of the first people to reach out and call me. I was doing a um, the Black Art Festival in Philadelphia and I had hung up my artwork, my quilt work, and out of the blue, my cell phone rang, and it was you on the other end. And you invited me to submit images for a quilt exhibit you were putting together. And I think that was Jazz and Quilts. What was it called? Textural Rhythms. Textural Rhythms. I mean, that was a huge exhibit. It went to Japan, it went to yes. museum in New York, and I was um, in grad school just making my quilt. So to get that phone call from you, it was affirmation, you know, saying, I see what you are doing. And I, and it's always been word of mouth. You know, I wasn't really online like we are now with the social media. And it gave me, like you said, a venue it, it introduced me to not only yourself, but other women and the women of color, um, WCQN, the Quilters Network. Um, I still have all those connections to this date. And I, I guess I should say that it be, became that support network. And then that leads to another question that I have for you about um, what do you think is missing? You know, you're doing a lot of work to help Black women um, and, and other women, but who, people who keep our, our social and political agendas in their work. What do you think is missing now? I think, first of all, I would love to see more historians, more young African-Americans that are interested in history and the pre preservation of this history and this work. Mm -hmm. um, there, are, there are very, very few of us. And mm -hmm. I think the participation of African-American scholars is important in the field. Mm -hmm. um, so we can have someone write from our viewpoint and be genuinely interested um, in preservation and documentation as we are. So that's one thing. And then I would also like to see more African-American quilt makers. People think that we are a huge entity in the quilt world. We are not, we're like a fraction of 1% when you think about all the millions of quilt makers in the United States. Quilting yeah. is a multi, multi billion dollar a year industry, and we're just a tiny segment of it. So that's the one thing we I, I'm kind of distressed about because we, as uh, a network, have not been able to interest a lot of younger people in quilt mm -hmm. making. It's very difficult mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they see it as hard and tedious and slow mm -hmm. and in this yeah. world of hurry, hurry, rush, rush, and electronic everything, it's very difficult uh, to interest young folks in doing things with their hands. Yeah. Um, and would you say 
that is the legacy that you want to leave or, or what would you characterize that as? Well, yeah, the legacy would be uh, leaving that footprint um, in the canon of American quilt history about the diversity of uh, African American quilts and how great those, how wonderful those quilts are. So, mm -hmm. yes, that that's very important for me that that history be duly noted. Yes. 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 And then again, when I think about you, young Bisa, <laughs> I <laughs> I often wonder. Well, I wonder a lot of things. Okay. When you see, you have you have quite a following in, well, not only in the United States, but around the world. When you see viewers come uh, to exhibits of your work, what do you want the viewer to take away from your work mm -hmm. when they see it? I think I'm glad you asked that because, and I'm also really glad that you read Michelle's statement because we're all in line there. You know, I hope that when people see my work, they see us, the real us, as we want to present ourselves. How do Black people want to be seen? How do we want to be spoken of? How do we want to be remembered? And I think, I would think, I guess, even by coming to an exhibit where my work is somebody else from another race, that's an act in itself and saying, like, I'm acknowledging that your work is worth me even looking at. And um, I hope that it clicks that we're humans and we have these desires and this need and deserve to live, to breathe equally. Like, I hope that that transmits. I think it does. <laughs> <laughs> I see that a lot. And, and I, I get letters and comments from people that have seen your work and they're taken they're so taken with it. And that, that's, that's the one commonality, uh, especially from African-Americans. They do, they see themselves in your work. And mm -hmm. on that same note, mm -hmm. how, how that segues into how you want to be remembered for your work. So that yeah. your comments were a good segue. And you had said something else about this was another day we were talking and I said something about quilters versus artists. And it really made me think, cause you said, you don't see any difference. A quilter is an artist and how I describe myself. I say I'm an artist who uses quilting as a medium so that people get that idea. You are the artist, you can use whatever you want to express yourself. And I hope that my legacy would be breaking, help break down that barrier. You know, yes. the, the, the glass ceiling, seeing black women succeed, allowing us to do exactly what we want to do, seeing us in the highest places or, or the lowest places, but wherever we want to be, we should be. There. And, and that, and that you're doing because it's, uh, Quilting is very popular. I never get into the uh, argument craft versus art. It is all mm -hmm. art. It's mm -hmm. all art. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, this is proven now with so many quilts in, in museums. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. have long seen that the quilts have jumped off the bed onto the wall and they're now seen as works of art, as yeah. they should be seen as works yeah. of art. Uh, I think anything created from spirit and soul and uh, and and made as such, it's it's art. I don't care what it is. So it's it's yeah. it's all good. Yeah. And then I have one more question for you. I know I wasn't supposed to ask this many questions, but I don't usually get to ask you all the questions I want. <laughs> but you're. You talk a lot about your own motivations, and I'm wondering about your, your parents. Um, were they art people? Were they civil rights people? Like, and is, did that help form you? No. Um, my 
parents, my mother taught library, library science at Southern. Oh, nice. <clears throat> and my father was a chemist. Um, my father was very much interested in all things dealing with history. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and I had a lot of relatives at the time that were involved in civil rights because we came up during that civil rights era. They were yeah. marching. I remember my brother was the first African-American to a uh, student to integrate the local high school. So wow. they were active, they were active, yeah. but also living as an African-American in this country, it's important to me um, to talk about issues that adversely affect us because yeah. I'm thinking about my children. I'm thinking about my grandchildren. This is their country too. So mm -hmm. whatever you can do <clears throat> as a citizen and as a mother, you want to mm -hmm. make better. You want to make better for the future. So you have to be involved on some level yeah. Uh, in, about inflicting a change. Yeah, yeah, understood. So uh, I, I hear a little bell, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it must be time for I questions. So. <laughs> I think so. Oh. Yes, I have been getting lots of questions from the audience. I think, um, the first one that I would like to ask is uh, one of our audience members wants to know more about your process and how both speakers construct their quilts. How long does it take to conceptualize and construct your quilts from start to finish? Bisa? Um, <laughs> it takes me a long time. Um, I, I would say I average about 200 to 300 hours to create just a single figure piece. And that doesn't even, I don't even want to think about how long does it take to pick an image or even think of the, the, the idea in the first place. And, and my work basically is, I'm, I work like a collagist, you know, cutting up little bits of fabric. I start with a photograph, I'm very um, photographic based. I don't think I could do it. I'm not the type of person who can just sketch something without looking at it. I'm always looking at a photo. I create a sketch, which becomes my pattern, just like a dressmaker. And I'm cutting up these bits of fabric to fit the shapes on my sketch. And then I have, I pin everything together, which takes, that's where the 300 hours come in. And then I quilt it. So the quilting is actually the fastest part and the most fun part. As for me, I, I keep sketchbooks and because I wear many hats, I, you know, write and curate, it's very difficult for me to get time in the studio. So I have all these sketchbooks and uh, when I get time, I, I look at the pieces that really inspire me that I want to get out in, in quilt form. And I've never really, I have never, uh, timed how long it takes to make a quilt. I think if I did that, I wouldn't be making them because <laughs> it takes too long. Yeah. So I, I don't I don't keep track of the time. When it's finished, it's finished, you know. And then some are never finished. I have a closet full of uh, <laughs> unfinished tops. You know, I start out loving them and then I fall out of love with them and stick them in the closet and maybe go back 10 years later mm -hmm. and 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 work on that piece so it, it mm -hmm. depends mm -hmm. we have another question um from an audience member that was directed towards Bisa but I think that it it relates to both of your work uh Bisa some passages look very painterly in your work do you dye your own fabric or paint on the fabric and then I know Dr. Maslumi, you incorporate paint in some of your quilts. So maybe both of you can talk a little bit more about, you know, that intersection between textiles and other media like painting. Well, I was trained as a painter. So um, 
I'm still thinking in the same modes of layers. And I think that's how they look like paintings. But I don't dye fabric and I don't paint on it. Um, I used to do a little bit of dyeing, but it just seemed like that was a whole nother form of art. And I would have all these types of dyes and I needed all of a sudden a wet studio. My studio is dry and I had two little children my two little daughters were always underfoot, sometimes literally sitting on my lap while I was trying to get something done. And then I had a toddler at the time who, she was the one who wanted to be on my lap so much. My cousins actually showed me how to tie her on my back, African style with, with just a fabric, um, with a, a sheet of fabric and tying the baby tight. And she could hear my heartbeat through there. She was calm and then I could work. But all that to say that I kept my studio dry for many years because of being a mother and it was easier for me. And so I'm not painting or dyeing the fabric because either neither one of those things were safe for the, the little ones underfoot. I don't dye fabric. I will buy dyed fabric, but I don't dye it myself. Um, and I do paint on the fabric occasionally. Hey. Um... So here's another question uh, directed towards Dr. Maslumi, but I think that maybe both of you will have some thoughts about this. Uh, someone says, I'm an admirer of the quilts from the Quilters of G's Bend. I'm so grateful to be inspired by them. I wonder what your thoughts are about those quilts. And then a side note, Visa, your quilts are so very intricate and I appreciate hearing the stories behind them. Um, I've known the some of the quilters from G's Bend for almost 50 years. Uh, some of them are like my, my mothers, we're that old and I'm, I'm way on the other side of 70. So I know some that are in their late 80s and uh, I'm, I was happy to see their quilts uh, become prominent in art history. And they deserve that. Uh, those quilts were made, when you think about them and the history of that, that, that area that they live in, there was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into those quilts. When you think about really what they meant as simple utilitarian uh, quilts that were meant to keep people warm, a people who had very little, very little and struggled every day uh, for a livelihood so that they could take care of them, could take care of themselves and their families. So I look at that when I, I think about those quilts, the blood, sweat and tears and the history of a people that made those quilts. That's the importance that I attach to those quilts. I am, I'm happy that art historians found value and, and beauty in those quilts. Um, one of the reasons that I started the Women of Color Quilters Network was to let African-American quilters know uh, the cultural significance of their work as well as the monetary value. And quilts are very important to African-American culture. And the quilts of G's Bend are at the heart and essence of what we do uh, as African-Americans and that the public found beauty in that. It was a lesson too for the women of G's Bend because this is, this is a common fact in the African-American uh, quilt community. Elder African-American quilters never saw their work as art. They never saw that work as a thing of beauty. But white folks have always known the value and appreciated the beauty of what African people and African-American people create because who are the biggest collectors of our work? It is not us, it's not us. So uh, people from outside of the culture have always known 
the essence of, of, of an importance of what we do. So I'm glad now that we have more young African Americans that are beginning to appreciate and collect art. That's important. I feel we always, as Black folk, have to leave something behind for our next generation and generations after that. And we can't just give away everything. We have to have something left for the culture. Because I, I envision just nightmarishly so we'll wake up and be like uh, folks in Africa. All African antiquities are where? Most of them. They're not in yeah. Africa. <laughs> and they're in the museums in Europe and, with the, in, and, and the United States. So, yeah. We have to be woke <laughs> yeah. and aware. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. I have um, another question for Visa. Can you talk about the role, if there is one, of dandyism in the Frederick Douglass quilt? Oh, yes. Um, it's something that I guess I learned by watching my grandfather, you know, when I talk about when you speak of a dandy, you know, somebody who's suave and handsome and really cares about their appearance. I was attracted to that image in Frederick Douglass also because he was a very good looking man and, and a very well-dressed man. So that's at the basis of it. But it is a familial trait that I saw in my grandfather and then in, in my brother as well, my dad. Um, and I think that when I choose a photo, I'm always looking for those like recognitions of home, things that are familiar. And I see that in our community, black people, we like to look good. So seeing that in Frederick Douglass made me see him as a man, a contemporary man, and not like as this historical figure who seemed untouchable and almost, almost like um, the way we look at him in the black community, I wouldn't say maybe like a prophet in a way you know when I saw him looking so sharp like that I realized oh Frederick Douglass the dandy like Frederick Douglass the man and I felt that I wanted to capture that humanistic part of him so other people could see what I what I had saw great thank you I think we might have time for one more question um, somebody asks, and this is for both of you, how do you describe your inner state when you're creating? What are you feeling, knowing, sensing while you're alone with your work? Dr. Mazumi. I, I feel that the creation of a quilt and any art, it's a very spiritual experience. And I think it's spirit guided. I really do. Um, in the creation of that work, God doesn't let you make mistakes. So uh, this art is a, a gift. It's a gift. It's a God-given gift. And uh, for me, when I'm creating, I find it very, very uh, spiritual, especially the act of quilting because it's repetitive. Um, and you have a chance to meditate and think while you're quilting. So it's a spiritual experience for me. I totally, I completely agree. I think there's something that happens right while we're working. You feel peaceful and you almost feel in communion with your ancestors. When somebody brought up the Jeez Ben, when I see their work, I think of home. You know, I think of grandmothers and the comfort and also how hard they work. So I'm always feeling like the guidance of those who came before me. And I could say, God, maybe angels, ancestors, I feel like they are there while I'm working. And I think that if, if that's disconnected, the peace does doesn't have it and you can see it and it's amazing that people can see that it always surprises me it shouldn't when people sometimes they'll see my work and I wonder like how do they know how do they but but they feel it I think uh, 
that's the perfect place for us to end. And unfortunately, the time has come for the event to close. But I just want to thank you both so much. I'm sure that if we were with a live audience right now, you would be getting roaring applause and wish we could all be together in person. But this has been such an incredible virtual event tonight. And I just want to thank you so much um, on behalf of TMA and from everybody in the audience for such a thoughtful conversation and presentations of your work. Um, so thank you so much for being here. And thank you also to everybody in the audience who's been participating this evening. Um, we appreciate you all and take care. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to both of you. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.